فتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون There is a loneliness where you are estranged from everyone around you and it's really interesting because that loneliness is the ghurba that being strange that Allah described the situation of the Prophet ﷺ with where you're physically around people but no one understands you and people are cutting you off and people have alienated you and sometimes, not always, sometimes that is because of a principled stance that you take or because of some truth that you manifest that others around you are not willing to commit to, sometimes. Sometimes you are alone and estranged because of your bad character, your bad akhlaq, or the way that you treat people. And there's no nobility in that. Sometimes people don't deal with you, and you, uh, you, know, you comfort yourself by saying, no one likes me because I speak the truth. But it's not about you speaking the truth. It's about you having a foul mouth. And there's no nobility in that. There's no reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that. The Prophet sallallahu he said the worst people are those that people don't correct when they speak anymore, when they lose their temper, because they don't want to deal with their tongues anymore. They just get sick of dealing with them, going off on them and their tempers and things of that sort. That's a very bad loneliness to have when people don't want to deal with your adha, with your harm. But then when a person is upon the truth and a person is upon righteousness and they feel alienated by everyone <clears throat> around them, and the worst the worst of that is when it's your own family. And when you look at the Prophet ﷺ, when he stood up alone on a safa and called a people that loved him and respected him for four decades, four decades of establishing goodwill to his people. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have much in this world before prophethood. He wasn't a wealthy man. He didn't have his parents. He was an orphan. He was not, you know, he didn't live any lavish or extravagant lifestyle. He was a simple, honest merchant, alayhi salatu wasalam, a shepherd. He described himself for six years on the outskirts of Mecca, where Ajyad is uh, shepherding sheep for the qararit of the people of Mecca, the pennies of the people of Mecca, the equivalent of the pennies of the people of Mecca. But he always had the love of his people. The goodwill that he established with his people lasted. And then there you are, at the age of 40 years old, standing on Safa, and you call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you establish your goodwill once again and say, if I were to tell you that there's an army that is on its way to affect you, to hurt you, would you believe me? And they all expressed that they trusted him and that he was a sadiq al-ameen. They trusted him not because of the, you know, the claim making sense, but because of who he was, that he'd, he'd established that he was a sadiq al-ameen, the trustworthy one, the truthful one, the honest one. And they knew that he always wanted to protect them from harm. So he invoked that sallallahu alayhi wa when he called them to Allah. But what ended up happening? When he said what he said, all the voices went silent, except for Abu Lahab cursing him. He became a stranger amongst his people. And they hurt him by saying that the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has forsaken him. وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى your Lord did not bid you farewell, nor did he forsake you. Qala is not a physical separation as much as it is an abandonment, where you're estranged. You're not in that situation. And that's the most difficult test that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions felt. Probably, and I'm projecting because everyone is very different, but for many people, for many of the companions, more so than the physical torture, was the emotional torture of being outcasts amongst their own people. And you can imagine the pain that they felt when their own relatives plotted against them and their own relatives tried to kill them and even pursued them and stole their wealth and wished nothing but evil upon them, starting with the Prophet It's a difficult society and a very difficult situation to deal with for each and every single person that's there. And you have to humanize that experience for a moment. How would you feel if by accepting the Prophet Sallallahu and by being upon the truth, you're completely abandoned? The Prophet Sallallahu was not the first one to go through that. <clears throat> In fact, the very first messenger of Allah, Nuh Alayhi Salaam, ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا امْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَامْرَأَةَ لُوطٍ كَانَتَا تَحْتَ عَبْدَيْنِ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا صَالِحَيْنِ فَخَانَتَاهُمَا Allah mentions 
the wife of the first messenger of Allah, Nuh alayhi salam. And she herself did not believe. Can you imagine spending 950 years calling people to Allah and your own wife disbelieves? And you're estranged from your own wife and the son of Nuh alayhi salam. Obviously the painful conversation that we have of Noah, of Nuh alayhi salam in the Quran, calling out to his son and hoping that his son would follow, but his son leaves him behind. Lut alayhi salam, his own wife, his own spouse, the uncle of Lut alayhi salam, of course, being Ibrahim, Abraham alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam, afsahul anbiya, the most eloquent of the prophets, the father of the prophets, and look, all of those years of elaborate arguments with his people and trying to guide them to the truth, and he leaves Haran without a single believer except for his wife except for Sarah. Everybody else, and at the head of them was his father trying to kill him. Everybody else abandons him and leaves him in that situation. That's hard to imagine. And when you look at the generation of the Prophet Sallallahu the Sahaba, the best generation, which was an entire generation of reverts, an entire generation of people that accepted faith and that accepted the principles that came with faith that caused them to be persecuted and go through what prophets and their companions had gone through before. And Allah tells us about Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas anhu, and his mother when Sa'ad who loved his mother deeply and his mother said that either you abandon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or I will sit out here in the sun and starve to death or be dehydrated until either the lice kill me or the sun kills me, the thirst kills me. And she sat out there until the sister of Sa'ad had to force water into her mouth because she, all, she actually wanted to fo fulfill her oath of killing herself if Sa'ad did not leave Islam. Can you imagine how painful that would be if your mother, out of love for you, She's upon falsehood, you're upon truth, but out of love for you, she was, she's willing to kill herself. Reveal what he revealed about Abu Lahab. It's really interesting here. What Allah revealed about Abu Lahab, we know what Allah revealed about Abu Lahab and his wife, because Abu Lahab did not reject truth out of any noble sentiment, or out of any love for the Prophet Sallallahu It was out of love of wealth, and the love of fame, and the love of prestige, and the filthy mouth of Abu Lahab and all of the, the pain that he caused the Prophet ﷺ, that wasn't out of love, that was out of greed. So, tabbat yada Abi Lahab in watab. But Sa'ad and his mother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah Al-Ahqaf, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا حَمَلَتُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهَا وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهَا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرَا Allah mentioned that we have enjoined upon man that he treats his parents with the utmost kindness and he particularly mentioned the rights of the mother upon a person. Even as she was calling her son to reject Allah, Allah was calling him to honor her. Allah orders Sa'ad to honor his mother. And even if your parents tell you to commit kufr, tell you to commit disbelief and associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or reject your Lord, still, لا تطعهما, do not obey them in that but at the same time, accompany them with kindness and treat them with love and respect, simply not doing as they command you to do in regards to evil. Simple as that. Allah called Sa'ad to honor his mother. And Allah mentions in that same ayah that a person who Allah blesses, who, who reaches, and uh, you know, حتى إذا بلغ أشده وبلغ أربعين سنة قال ربي أوزعني أن أشكر نعمتك التي أنعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن أعمل صالحا ترضى وأصلح لي في ذريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين. A man who reaches his age of maturity and reaches the age of 40 years old and thanks Allah for the blessing that he bestowed upon him and upon his parents and prays for his children. And that is in regards to, according to many of the scholars, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And this is a really powerful statement that Al-Qurtubi makes. There is not a single companion from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa companions whose entire family accepted faith except for Abu Bakr. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not have that. Abu Bakr is the only companion who did not have a rejector from his family. 
That's significant. That was a particular blessing that Allah honored him with. Maybe because he followed the Prophet ﷺ with no hesitation. He was a Siddiq. He followed the Prophet ﷺ with no hesitation. And so he was blessed with a very specific blessing that everyone in his family, his parents, his spouse, his children, would all accept Iman, would all accept faith. Not without a struggle. Some of them took long. But they'd all accept faith. And he knew that he was unique in that. That's, I mean, just think about that. When you're sitting with the companions, each and every single one of them has a story about a spouse or a parent or a child or a sibling that's rejecting them. And that's alienating them and isolating them. Except for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And his father was the last one. His father, Abu Quhafa, held out until Fatih Mecca, until the conquest of Mecca, very late. And he was such an old man that when... Uh, when, when Abu Bakr brought his father to, to take the shahada with the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you would have told me, I would have went to him. Why did you, why did you bring this shaykh, this old man from his home? I would have gone to him. Even though he'd spent 20 years rejecting the Prophet ﷺ. And you know what? Abu Bakr, and it's, it's, very, it's hard to imagine this, but Abu Bakr, when... He sees his father with his hand in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ with a full head of gray saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. He started crying very heavily. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ma yubkika ya Abu Bakr, what's making you cry? And he said, I wish that that hand that was in your hand was the hand of your uncle Abu Talib. Because I know how much you wanted that. How much it would have meant to the Prophet ﷺ that even he didn't get that وسلم, for the person who was the closest to a father figure in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam, he didn't get to enjoy what Abu Bakr was enjoying at that moment. And Abu Bakr loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi more than himself. All of this was actually to intro a very interesting character in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If I was to ask you who the first believer is, many people would say that the first person to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was Abu Bakr. And you would be right if you were talking about the men. But the first believer in the Prophet ﷺ was Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. The first one who actually believed in him was Khadija, his wife. And I want you to think about the family of Khadija. And there's a very particular character who, when you read about him, it's stunning that you don't hear more about him. He was in the ranks of Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and... Uqba bin Ami Mu'eet, and uh, these people that were the prominent rejectors of the Prophet ﷺ. But you don't hear much about him. He was the little brother of Khadija radiallahu anha. His name was Nawfal ibn Khuwaylid. The little brother, the younger brother of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Nawfal ibn Khuwaylid. Can you imagine the first believer in the Prophet ﷺ? His wife, the most loyal dedicated believer, a woman of perfect faith with her loyalty, and she is our mother. May Allah be pleased with her. She is our mother. Can you imagine Khadija's brother, what his name was, what his nickname, what his laqab was? His nickname was Shaytan Quraysh, the devil of Quraysh. And he was the most, one of the most harsh rejectors of the Prophet ﷺ. He was a huge man with the same stature as Abu Jahl. And this is the brother-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ and the brother of the most beloved person in the world to him. And he was the only person who had the audacity to torture Abu Bakr, by the way, in Mecca. He tied up Abu Bakr and Talha. May Allah be pleased with them. They were too noble to be tortured in public. He was the only person that had the audacity to privately tie them up. And they were al-qarinayn, the two tied ones together, and to whip them and torture them tied up together. He took his nephew, as zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he wrapped him in a hasir, in a straw mat, and he lit a fire under him while he tortured him in Mecca. And he was one of the people who plotted the boycott of the Prophet ﷺ that led to the death of his own sister, Khadija. Can you imagine that? That you have such a hatred for the truth that you would plot the boycott that would lead to the death of your sister, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Of course, the conditions of the boycott and it eventually led to her death. And he was one of those that planned the killing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
And he was one of those that showed up on the Battle of Badr, the day of the Battle of Badr. Can you imagine what that did to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And what that was like for Khadija radiallahu anha? How does the brother of Khadija end up being such a horrible person and a, whor- a, t- you know, a, a human being that hurts the Prophet Sallallahu the way that he does? And can you imagine what it was like for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to see Nofal standing on the other side? And by the way, he's not the father of Waraqa. Uh, Khadija had a brother named Nofal as well as an uncle named Nofal. Imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeing his brother-in-law standing on the other side of the battlefield on the day of Badr and what that did to him alayhi salatu wasalam and how much it hurt him. Think about that. And he just lost Khadija radiallahu anha shortly before that, a few years before that. And he's looking at Nofal. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Nofal standing on the battle of Badr, the brother of Khadija against him, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He said, Allahumma ikfini, oh Allahumma ikfini Nofal, oh Allah, uh, do away with Nofal, suffice me in regards to Nofal. I mean, he has hurt the Prophet ﷺ for so long, and now he has the audacity. You would think he would have had some sympathy after Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. Now he has the audacity to stand and to want to kill the Prophet ﷺ in Badr. And who is the one that would kill him instead? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was raised by his sister, Khadija radiallahu anha. This is tough. This is tough. This is as difficult as it gets. And this is to show you that that isolation and that loneliness penetrated the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself in every single way. It's one thing when you have a person in your family who refuses to accept you but does not show such hostility towards you. It's another thing when the brother of the most beloved person in the world to you, Khadija radiallahu anha's brother, is standing against you. How does Khadija, the first believer, a perfect woman of Iman, end up with Nofal as her brother? It's the same way that the next ayah in Surah Tahrim, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَأَةَ فِرْعُونَ The same way that you have a woman like Asya, a woman of perfect Iman, married to the worst human being, in the history of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his ways. And there are people that when they accept truth will face obstacles none so greater than their own family. One of the fitnas that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned of the fitna of Dajjal, the fitna of the Antichrist, is that he would, there is a young man that would challenge him and that would stand in front of him and think that he, he's full of belief and he can, he can overcome the, the test, the trial of Dajjal. And the Dajjal would raise an illusion of his parents being raised from the grave. Can you imagine? The Dajjal would make it seem like he raised his parents from the grave to tell him to believe in him. That's a fitna that he would not be able to overcome. It's a test. It's a trial. Obviously, there are many lessons that we can derive from this, and time would not give us all of the lessons that we can derive from this. One of them is that on the Day of Judgment, You don't get to stake your claim and say that I was related to this person or I was related to that person and that's my way to Jannah. Because at the end of the day, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ was Abu Lahab. And there is an entire surah dedicated to his punishment in hellfire. It did him no good. It did the wife of Nuh no good. The wife of Lut no good. The father of Ibrahim no good. It did nothing for them. There is no claim in relationship. You don't get to say, well, I came out of this household. In fact, what the ulama will mention is that if Allah has put righteous people amongst you in your family or your close circle, that's a greater testimony against you. Look at these people, what they had to struggle with. And that's why the most rewarded amongst us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and elevate you, are those who did have to revert that are sitting in this masjid right now and face that isolation from your families and didn't find the warmth and the compassion from the community that, was, that, that could have not replaced it, because nothing can replace that, but at least soften it. Allah knows your struggle, and Allah knows your pain, and you are like the companions of the Prophet ﷺ when they face that isolation. But when we look at ourselves, if Allah has given us righteous, truthful parents, and people that raised us to think right and to believe, 
and we still turn away, that's a proof against us. That's not to our favor on the day of judgment. That's actually against us on the day of judgment. What else do we learn from this? Something that I wanted to drive home, which I think is very important, and I hope I can summarize it in the couple of minutes that I have. When you are forced to be alone in your principles and in your faith, and loneliness has many different implications and many different layers, that strengthens your resolve upon that truth. And there is nothing more rewarding than that. When your environment doesn't change you for evil, when the people you love most showing you hostility because you're upon truth or faith show you hostility and that doesn't change you, when in fact you're even able to maintain ihsan towards them, excellence towards them because the compassion that they're not showing you, you're getting in your worship of the most merciful, in your private time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Rahman, Rahim, Al Wadud, the most compassionate, the most loving, the most merciful, that's giving you the capacity to still be able to show them that mercy even as they show you none, even as a community. You know, I know that as we look right now around the world and you know, inshallah, I, I, we have Sheikh Saad who will fundraise for Ghulta shortly after the Salah, what we have taking place in Syria. And I saw those, one of the titles of one of the Syrian aid workers who called it a motionless world watching a wholesale massacre of people. The Palestinian people have been abandoned. The Syrian people have been abandoned. The Yemeni people have been abandoned. The, the, the people in the Rohingya have been abandoned. The Somali refugees were abandoned. The Bosnians were abandoned. Many of the Muslims that struggle in Ethiopia and suffer in Ethiopia, they're abandoned. All of these people facing abandonment. And here we are as a community. And we have the ability to do something for them as much as we can. We shouldn't leave them alone because the worst thing that we could feel is to be left alone as a community. And in this era where it's fashionable of some sorts to embrace Muslims because we have a racist president or someone that hates Muslims so bluntly and hates our religion and appoints Islamophobes all the time. It's something for us to go and to cling on to our allies. And as much as we appreciate our allies, we also have to develop some resolve ourselves as a community and stick to some sort of truth. No matter what, if people around us hate us or if they love us, we reciprocate love when people love us, and we still show ihsan, excellence, to those that hate us. But as a community, are we really willing to develop that resolve and that truth, even when we are abandoned? Because this love fest of the Muslim community is not going to last very long. <laughs> when it's no longer fashionable to do so, it's not going to be there. Do we have the resolve upon that truth to face that ghurba, that being strange and that being left alone? I, I pray that we do. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we develop that truth and that principle to where we are able to do so. But it's something for us to think about. And this, is the, this was the test of the Prophet Sallallahu that he lost in a few days, Abu Talib, his uncle who was protecting him, and the most beloved person in the world to him, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, and then had to face in Badr, the son of his uncle, <laughs> Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, killing the brother of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha for the hostility that he continued to show to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of us will ever know what that exactly felt like. None of us can ever endure what the Sahaba endured collectively. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he places within us that resolve upon the truth and that ihsan with, the, uh, with, with, with others, even as we are tested with that resolve upon the truth. May Allah grant us that sincerity and that thabat and that firmness and steadfastness upon the truth and never allow us to be cut off from him because he who is cut off from him will not find any solace or tranquility in any companionship in the world and he who has him will be fulfilled by him subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that he can face all of the trials and the hardships of this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not test us beyond our capacity and not leave us estranged and allow us to reach out and to comfort those who have been abandoned by others only because they are upon the truth. Allah, Allah.